I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and finance. This week, a special look at capitalism. After the global financial crisis, the credit crunch, the Occupy movement, is capitalism bust? Is the West still pandering to the banking system? And can emerging markets show the way forward? That is our sole focus this week, and we're taking a departure from our usual format, instead bringing in three economic experts for a show-long debate. We'll introduce them shortly, but first we want to start laying out the arguments for you. On the broad face of it, this is a capitalist world. Even China's joined the free market with more than a little enthusiasm. But a worldwide financial crisis, towering government debt, and the public outrage of the 99% perhaps suggests otherwise. Perhaps the free market isn't free enough. Here's some numbers to get us going this week. The United States, astounding $15.23 trillion debt. A Tea Party, you might claim government spending and central bank meddling have distorted the market. But on the other side, Occupy campaigners can agree that capitalism brings excessive wealth to the few. In fact, the Economic Policy Institute found 1% of US households control 42.7% of financial assets, more than double what the remaining 90% does. And with wealth, of course, comes influence. 24.3% of all political donations in the 2010 election cycle were made by just 0.01% of Americans. Sadly, the developing world often gets ignored in these discussions. According to UNICEF, the richest 20% of the world's population controls 82.8% .8 of its income. The poorest 20%? Just 1% of the wealth. So the disparity is obvious. And just one final little representation, if you like, which points to the excesses in this world. It would take an additional 4.4 worlds, Earths if you like, in order for there to be enough for everybody to consume as much as your average American does. So our central question on this episode of Counting the Cost is capitalism bust? And these are our three guests who are going to debate the topic with us. Mark Weisbrot in Washington, D.C. He is the co-founder and co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. We've got Brian Kaplan in Fairfax, Virginia, professor of economics at George Mason University and adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. And rounding out the panel is Loretta Napoleoni in London. She's an economist and author of Maonomics, Why Chinese Communists Make Better Capitalists Than We Do. That will provide us with some interesting talking later on. Uh, thank you so much to all three of you for joining us for Counting the Cost. I do appreciate it. I want to actually start with a little quote, if you don't mind, and just get your views just briefly uh, so our viewers and I can get more of an idea of where you're all coming from. It's from uh, Joseph Stiglitz, the uh, Nobel Prize winner and former chief economist at the World Bank, who said, uh, and I'm quoting here, there is no longer any credibility, if there ever was, uh, to the interpretation of Adam Smith's ideas that suggests firms' pursuit of self-interest leads, as if by an invisible hand, to the well-being of society. What do we all think of that? Mark Weisbrot, first of all. Well, I, I think the probably a oh, full disclosure, I guess, uh, Joe Stiglitz is part of our advisory board. But uh, I think that uh, that's been true for a long time. You know, every economy in the world, almost every economy is a mixed economy. And uh, so it's just a question of what is the role of the state. And uh, obviously you've had a big, I think what he's referring to is the Great Recession was probably the biggest uh, uh, economic crisis since the, the Great Depression. And it was clear uh, that there was a, a regulatory a failure was a big part of that. And uh, so, uh, you know, in terms of firms pursuing their own interests, you know, leading to an outcome, well, you know, that's never really been uh, true. There's always had to have been an important role of the state. And, uh, you know, so, so there's really nothing new there. Okay, let's see what Brian Kaplan thinks in Fairfax. You make a very good point, which is that every major economy in the world is a mixed economy, which makes it very strange when people take a look at events and say, aha, events prove that capitalism doesn't work. Uh, what they show is that the mixed economy doesn't work as to whether that is because of the capitalist side of it or the government side of it is a very open question, which people are very quick to judge. Loretta, your thoughts? Well, Adam Smith actually does talk about the uh, need for an economy to be regulated. And he talks specifically about uh, the hidden hand in uh, certain circumstances. So I think that... Uh, um, the theory is still valid today. We have abused um, 
our economy, our financial uh, uh, situation in particular, and uh, this abuse has taken place by deregulation, so the progressive dismantling of rules and regulation which are necessary in any type of economy, mixed economy or you know, mm. even you know, a free, completely free economy. Got a lot of topics to cover off. I want to go back to 2008 and use this financial crisis that we've just seen as, as our key example. I guess that's when the wheels really started to fall off. You know, Mark Weiss, but I'll come back to you. Did that just expose the system there and then? Did we see, uh, you know, when the idea of too big to fail came through and all these things, did that just expose capitalism for what it was in a, in a, in a nasty way, if I can use that phrase? Well, you've had a lot more, uh, you've had a lot of crises before then. You've had, actually, you had a long period from 1960, uh, from 1980 uh, to the early 2000s, where you had a failure, a, a great failure of economic growth in the vast majority of low and middle income countries in the world. And you had some rebound o over the last decade, of course, but uh, so that period was a, really a failure as compared to uh, say previously 1960 to 1980 or the first half of the post-World War II uh, period. So you've had a lot more crises, you've had financial crises, you know, in the past 30 years. Mm. And you've had this also at the same time, this move towards what's called neoliberalism, a particular form of capitalism that uh, where obviously in developing countries the state had much less of a role, you had massive privatizations, you had much tighter fiscal and monetary policies, mm -hmm. the kind of uh, reforms actually that they're trying to implement in, in Europe right now and it's mm -hmm. not working very well. So I think a lot of what you're seeing is a breakdown of uh, what you would call neoliberal capitalism, which failed, I guess, if you're looking at it in terms of failure, uh, failed a lot worse than the prior form of capitalism that you had in the post mm. uh, first half and, of the and post what World you, War II period. What you also had this time, sorry to interrupt you, what you also had this time was an incredible backlash. Now, I can't speak to experience of, of what other financial crises were like, but this one, the the backlash against the 1% as they've now been, uh, become known, has almost marked this financial crisis in a different way. That's right, and that's been part of this neoliberal failure has been from the public, uh, from the viewpoint of the public interest, is that there's also been a massive redistribution of income and wealth, especially here in the United States. And so uh, people are rebelling against that, as well as the failure of the system on its own terms, that is the failure to grow and provide uh, growing employment. Brian Kaplan, let's bring you in. I mean, how the, can you say that? Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, how can you say that this has been a failure of the neoliberal system? Uh, as, as I think you probably know, uh, the first decade of the 21st century was the highest decade for economic growth in the history of the world. It wasn't just a rebound from a previous, uh, a previous era of failure. It's actually doing incredibly well around the world. Really what we see is that in the third world, there are a number of countries, especially China, India, that move very much in the direction of what you call neoliberalism towards more free market policies. And they're doing incredibly well. On the other hand, in the first world, we've been moving away from neoliberal policies, as you call them, free market policies, and we're doing worse. I, don't think that, I do not think that is a coincidence. I think the third world has been learning well, from what we used to know, and we've been forgetting what we used to know. Well, I, I can answer that, actually. I think the rebound you've had over the last uh, decade, and it's not the highest uh, growth, it's about where it was you know, in the 60s and, and 70s. But uh, that has been driven uh, for most of the countries that have come back. That's been driven by China. Uh, and China was the one country, as your other guests will verify, that didn't adopt the neoliberal policies. You know, the commanding heights, as you call them, of the of the uh, Chinese economy are still controlled by the government. The biggest corporations, most of the investment of the, of the country, the financial system. So it's kind of ironic, actually. You had these neoliberal uh, policy changes in the vast majority of the world's countries, and, the, and especially low and middle income countries most severely, uh, in the 80s and, and 90s. And you had this unprecedented economic growth failure. And then the one country that didn't adopt that grew so fast, it became the fastest growing economy in world history and became the largest economy almost already 
in the world, and that is what has pulled up dozens of developing countries through its imports uh, from Latin America, from Africa, and from other uh, developing countries. Mark, that is me, the, uh, one of the main reasons for their higher growth. Mark, let me so jump really in if I can. it really was a gross uh, failure. I, I'd like to jump in again uh, and actually bring in Loretta because I'm sure she's got something to say. Loretta, if you'd like to comment on anything the gentleman have said and then I'll throw the next question to you as well. I wouldn't call uh, Chinese economics a neoliberal economy at all. Uh, I think it is still very much uh, an economy controlled by a, a centralized state. Um, banks, for example, are all controlled by the state finance is completely controlled by the states. In fact, the Chinese are refusing to open up for fears of a crisis similar to the one that Asia experienced at the end of the 1990s. I think what we're seeing today is something that we have already seen at the end of the 19th century. Uh, when you know, capitalism reaches a certain degree of development, and let me say that capitalism is very much related to industrial growth, uh, what happened is that the return on financial investments start rising and you know, massive amount of money are moved from the productive sector you know, towards the financial sector. Now we've seen this happening at the end of the 19th centuries and eventually uh, that crisis brought World War I and then you know we seen the collapse of 1929 and then you know World War II. Now we're seeing more or less the same thing happening today whereby the productive active uh, system has migrated massively away from the West, so away from Europe and the United States, you know, towards emerging countries in okay, particular. Okay, Loretta. Talking about, you know, China. And seeing as you have brought up China, and this was a topic I was going to bring up later in the conversation, but, you know, let's do it now, seeing as we've talked about this idea of state capitalism, if you like. Um, China is the example you've used. I think you could even say the Middle East, a lot of the economies here, which are very prosperous, but everything does run through the state. Can you, and from, from your research that you've done into your book, see a way to make that work in the West? It's, it's almost diametrically opposed, but is there a way to make the model work elsewhere, do you think? Well, I don't think that we can apply that model to the West. Uh, that's a model of uh, for developing countries. Let's not forget that the Middle East uh, and China are still very much developing countries. Mm, now, we course. are in a post-industrial society. Now, I think uh, uh, one uh, way out of the current uh, uh, stalemate uh, in which you know Western countries are it, it is the return to common goods so in other words uh, an involvement uh, from the state uh, not necessarily as it was the welfare state of the past which clearly did not work and it was progressively dismantled but an involvement of the state in order to offer the citizen uh, um, certain kind of goods that otherwise uh, he has to buy uh, that will allow um, people to earn less because that is what uh, really we have to accept is the fact that we'll have a contraction of disposable income in the West. It is inevitable mm. because we are in a post-industrial society. Brian Kaplan, uh, I think you wanted to get in there. Why don't you say something? Yeah, I mean, there's no question that China has a lot of state involvement in the economy. My point was that China moved in a neoliberal direction. What would Mao Zedong say about China, to say, to China today? He would say communism has been destroyed, it's been replaced by capitalism, and from his point of view, he would be correct. Uh, it is not just China that has uh, had a great economic growth, it has also been India, uh, which also engaged in a lot of free market reforms, and now we are seeing uh, prosperity spreading around, uh, growing prosperity uh, spreading around the world in a truly amazing way, mm -hmm. just striking how <laughs> I, 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 you know, the setbacks in the first world have led people to say the entire system has been a disaster. It's working on a, for the world incredibly well. And in terms of uh, you know, where it's not working, it's, it seems to be working the least well in the first world where we are moving quickly away from the more free market policies that we used to have. In terms of uh, what Loretta said about the welfare state being dismantled, I, I would wonder what country on earth is she even talking about? Uh, well, you know, spending on, on entitlements and so on in first world countries is growing at a very rapid rate all over, all over the first world. Uh, the welfare state has not been dismantled. It is, it is uh, getting bigger than ever. 
Okay, Brian, given... Well, I disagree oh. completely, absolutely. Okay, just quickly, Larissa, go ahead. In Europe, it's not what is happening. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, but you know, if you come and have a look at the situation in Europe uh, and compare it to the 1970s, uh, it's totally different. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher in Europe, uh, I mean, in the United Kingdom, and then, of course, in the rest of, of Europe, following uh, Mrs. Thatcher policy, has been dismantling progressively the welfare state. It doesn't exist anymore. So, and the same thing, you know, we can say... What, what, it United doesn't States. exist no. anymore. What, what percentage of those budgets are spent on welfare? It's crazy to say that. Well, what it's not as it was in the, the 1970s. What percentage of the budget in Italy or Britain or France or Germany is spent on welfare? Uh, much, much less than it was spent in the 1970s. Okay, guys, I'm going to jump in. Or what it was in the 1970s. Sorry, Loretta, I'm going to jump in just because also we do have a problem with the, the satellite delay. Unfortunately, it means uh, we get a bit of talking over each other. And I would like to uh, bring Mark Weisbrot back into the conversation. Just change the subject a little bit because there's a few things I do want us to get through. I want to get your view and our other guests' view in a moment of the Occupy movement. What is your view of the way that the Occupy movement has gone about what it's done and its success or otherwise? You could argue that, yeah, it was powerful and it was vocal and it got a lot of um, coverage. We're looking at pictures of it now but success I mean how do you define it you, can you really define if it has been successful and how it could be successful well it was definitely successful it's been successful because it's changed the debate in the United States I mean you can just look at the media how many articles or programs did you have about inequality in this country when we've had the most massive upward uh, redistribution of income and wealth in our probably our entire history over the last 30 years where most almost all the income gains have gone to a very small uh, portion of the population since 1979, for example. And uh, so they've got that, they changed the debate, and they've made that an issue that all politicians now have to uh, pay attention to. But the, so the that's argument huge. I'm sort of uh, making th that's there. A, that's a success. Just to play devil's advocate, the argument I'm sort of making, the argument I'm making is that it's not, it hasn't got a, a, a leadership, if you like. It's a very disparate movement. It's big, and it, 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 it benefited hugely from the internet and social media and all these sorts of things. But it hasn't got a leadership like, and this is a, a strange comparison, but the Tea Party movement, if you like, which does have strong leadership, and it's got stated goals. The, the, the Occupy movement just wants more equality. Uh, how does it do that? Well, I mean, it's just starting out. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's only been here what, a few months, really. So. I think eventually it will, if it continues to grow, it will develop leadership, it will participate in the electoral process as well, and uh, it, will, it will have more impact in that sense. I mean, their goal from the beginning has to been to raise awareness and to change the debate, and that they've really done, and that's not an easy thing to do. Okay, Brian Kaplan, love to get your thoughts on the Occupy movement. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I find it very hard to take Occupy seriously because there is a there are, there are many government programs that make inequality worse. The one that I think is most worth talking about is immigration restrictions. Every first world country has immigration restrictions on the books to prevent the free flow of labor. If they were not on the books, there would be a huge number of very poor people from the third world moving to the first to join our labor markets. And this actually has a much larger effect upon inequality of people and, and, uh, and the living standards of people who are genuinely poor and yet they focus almost entirely on this dispute between people at the 99th percentile of the world income distribution and people at the 95th percentile. It's really just navel-gazing in its worst form. Loretta? Uh, there is an international coordination taking place at the moment, uh, uh, which is linking the Occupy movement and the Indignados um, in Europe. And they're trying to put together a group of people to um, make a proposal, uh, so to create a sort of international manifesto um, to prevent uh, uh, the um, um, inequalities that we have seen uh, um, taking place until today, but also to put forward a series of proposals for a new economic and political system. So they are moving, but um, unfortunately, <laughs> all the good things take a long time. Mm. Now, a few of you, I think all three of you, actually, at some point together, have mentioned Europe uh, in different ways. So I would like to talk about Europe a little bit, not obviously the sovereign debt crisis, that is a, a whole other thing, but there's one point which uh, I noticed in the research for this show which I thought was quite relevant the and I'm sure you know about this the tax which the European wanted to bring in on uh, financial transactions and it was Britain who blocked it saying well we're a huge financial center and this will this will really hurt us it kind of to me showed the idea of maybe putting the greater good or not putting the greater good ahead of 
the individual needs, the individual in this case being the UK. Loretta, seeing as you are in London, let me, let me get your view there first of all. Uh, yes, uh, uh, this is a, a very important issue which has been uh, debated uh, in Europe for, for the last you know, three months. Uh, um, now, um, I can understand uh, the UK position uh, uh, because, of course, uh, um, a taxation on a transaction, financial transaction, will hurt the city of London. Also, I must say that in this country there is this kind of trans um, taxation already in place which is called stamp duty now of course you know it's very low but you know it is in place uh, on top of that the United States has refused uh, to um, accept an imposition of this kind of, of uh, uh, taxation so um, I, because finance is global mm. uh, because uh, uh, banks and financial institutions uh, are uh, multinationals uh, um, if you introduce a taxation only in certain kind of countries and not in others what we're going to see is a migration of activities uh, from these countries to the others so a better solution would be to regulate uh, um, financial transaction to prevent uh, uh, speculation or to prevent uh, um um, excessive profits. Uh, now, of course, you know this requires uh, a, a much more complex legislation mm. and more time. And um, the European leaders, uh, uh, what they have done recently is to use uh, this uh, uh, taxation in order to gain uh, uh, support. Uh, in particular, I'm talking about Sarkozy in France, which is facing election very soon. So that's why the British are very reluctant. Brian, hasn't Loretta made a good point there that we need to, at least in some way or the other, get back to some regulation because otherwise we're just back to too big to fail all over again. I think this transaction tax is a, a good example of it. First of all, so we've always had a lot of regulation. We still have a lot of regulation. It's not a question of getting back to regulation. We've never left. Uh, what I would say about what uh, Great Britain is doing is uh, Great Britain's resistance is, on a, is an example of one of the few remaining checks on regulation that we have, uh, which is... Uh, state, you know, different governments at least compete with each other in order to maintain a more attractive business environment than, than other countries do. I think this is one of the things that is still making the system work, is at least if one country gets too far off track, other countries will say, look at those guys, at least we're not as bad as they are. Uh, I think what, re you know, what really needs to happen is countries that are not doing well need to take a look at countries that are doing better and say we should learn something from them instead of complaining about them. Good point. Mark Weisbrot, your thoughts on that? Is that? You know, using Europe as an example, there's a lot of learning to do for some countries at the moment. Well, first on the financial transaction tax, I mean, that makes perfect sense from an economic point of view. This is a sector that's grown all out of proportion to any kind of need for a financial sector. I mean, here before the crash, they were getting 40% of all uh, corporate uh, profits, and they quickly came back to that after uh, the recession. So this is huge, a huge bloated sector. So a tax to the extent that it reduces activity and raises tens of billions of dollars uh, that is badly needed. And, and not to mention that this sector played a huge role in causing the crisis and the unemployment that we're looking at today. Uh, this is a win-win kind of tax and nobody can uh, lose from it really from a public interest point of view. But in terms of Europe, I think it is the extreme case of uh, a, a very extreme case of neoliberalism uh, gone bad. You have this crisis that was caused by uh, neoliberal uh, policies. You know, again, the explosion of this, uh, well, a series of bubbles, you know, in the UK and Spain and Ireland, and of course the big bubble in the United States, which uh, caused a, a worldwide recession or contributed largely to the worldwide recession. And then you have these governments trying to impose more neoliberal policies on Greece and Spain and Portugal and Ireland and Italy, shrinking these economies actually when they're in recession. The opposite of what really uh, a basic Econ 101 course would tell you to do. So this is really mm. almost a form of madness mm. if you think about it in economic terms. And it is this rigid uh, kind of neoliberalism that we've been uh, talking about being applied without regard uh, to the what's what it's doing to people there and that's why you see so many people in the streets uh, you know and uh, in Athens is burning because of what they're doing to them you've got you know 20 percent unemployment there 24 percent unemployment in Spain and uh, it's all because of irrational uh, economic policy 
Folks, I'm starting to run out of time. I am going to leave the last word to Brian Kaplan just because the smile on your face, Brian, is, as Mark was talking then said you had something to say. Just briefly. Uh, yeah, that's right. So for, you know, for about 30 years, people in America have been pointing to Europe and saying how wonderful it is that they have a social democracy, how government plays a much bigger role. And now the system is crashing and burning. Well, it is an, an example of a failure of neoliberalism. Again, it's just crazy. People are so eager to blame things on capitalism that anything goes wrong on Earth. People point their fingers and say capitalism did it. Uh, it's not true. Mark Weisbrot, Brian Kaplan and Loretta Napoleone, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this special edition of thank Counting you. the Cost. Thank you. And that's about it for our special debate edition of Counting the Cost here this week. If you want to get in touch with us about the show, here's how you do it. Either send a tweet to me at Kamal AJE or our business editor at Abid Oliver Ali. Email is just fine, of course, if you're not on Twitter. Counting the cost at altazero.net is the address. Uh, and while you're online, altazero.com slash business. From there, you link on to the CTC page. We put all our episodes up there in full for you to catch up on whenever you want. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>